Perfect. So today we are going to talk about gradient descent algorithm. Okay, so throughout this uh, course in optimization, everything we will talk about henceforth will be based on the material that we are going to be talking about today. Uh, gradient descent algorithm is uh, an algorithm for solving optimization of this type. I want to minimize x and rn f of x. So it's an unconstrained, unconstrained minimization problem of a function f. f is a function from rn to r. It's of course continuous and differentiable. And for the purpose of this class, uh, this course, assume that they are infinitely differentiable. At the very least, they have to be twice differentiable uh, with continuous second derivatives, but let's just assume that they are all infinitely differentiable, so that way we don't get into any trouble. Uh, and what we had learned in the previous class was the first order necessary condition for optimality, x star optimal, or x star is local minimum. Let me write it as local minimum. implies gradient of f at x star must be equal to zero. The first derivative of the function f must be equal to zero. Uh, further, I hope you remember this diagram I had made in the previous lecture. So this is my Rn. These are the points that satisfy necessary condition. These are the points that are optimal. These are the points that satisfy sufficient condition. Uh, naturally, when we are trying to solve this problem, minimizing of f of x, we would like to find a point here. Unfortunately, all we can do is find a point which satisfies the necessary condition. And then we'll have to work a little bit more in order to ascertain that the point actually lies here. And that's the purpose of gradient descent algorithm. So in gradient descent algorithm, we'll find a point here, and then we do a little bit more analysis to conclude that actually the point doesn't lie here, but the point actually lies here. So it takes a little bit of effort. For convex function, of course, if you recall, for convex function, all of these three circles, all of these sets are actually the same. So the necessary condition is also sufficient if f is convex. But in general, when f is non-convex, uh, which is the case in a lot of different optimization problems, so if you're studying biomedical engineering, if you're studying civil engineering, if you're studying uh, uh, radars in electrical engineering, if you're studying radars and if you're studying signal processing, many situations you will have functions f that are non-convex as a result of which, all you can get is at this place. And in order to know whether you are here or whether you are here, it takes quite a bit of effort, OK? And never obvious, given the problem statement. Nonetheless, at least we will get to a point which satisfies the first order necessary condition for optimality. So how do we start uh, talking about gradient descent algorithm? So what's an algorithm? An algorithm is we start from some initial condition x naught. Then I need to take, I need to figure out what should my x1 be, what should my x2 be, what should my x3 be. So I need to go come up with a sequence x naught, x1, x2, x3, and so on, so that eventually we converge to a point which satisfies the first order necessary condition for optimality. Okay, so let's think about it. I have a function f. I'm standing at x, I want to find x prime, which is close to x. So here is how to think about it. So I'm standing at a point x, 
I want to get to a point x prime, which is close to x. Uh, and further, I want to make sure that my f of x prime is less than f of x. This is the requirement. f of x prime is less than f of x. So I'm descending. That's the point of this descent. Okay, So I want to descend in the landscape of the function. So I want to get to x prime, which is strictly less than f of x. So what do we do? Let's assume that this is the direction d. So I want to find x alpha, x plus alpha d. So I'm assuming alpha is some scaling parameter. So I pick a direction d, and I take a small step alpha in the direction d, and I get to this point x of alpha. And I want my f of x alpha to be less than f of x. Let's try to find out what, what f of x alpha is. So I can use the Taylor series expansion. So I have f of x plus alpha gradient of f of x transpose d plus small o of alpha. And I want to be less than f of x. I want this value here to be less than f of x. As I've mentioned previously, I want alpha to be a small variable. So this O of alpha is supposed to be very, very small. So alpha is small. O of alpha has to be very, very small. Now the only thing that is left to understand is what should this value of d be so that this term is less than this term. So now look, fx is the same on both the sides. So I can actually cancel f of x. So what, I, what I really want is gradient of fx transpose d plus O alpha over alpha should be less than 0. Uh, just a small note, I want alpha to be greater than 0. So now the question for you guys, what D should I pick so that this condition is satisfied? Assuming alpha is small positive scalar. What do you want D to be? Negative of the gradient. Do all of you agree that if I pick d to be negative of the gradient, then this term is strictly negative because this is negative gradient norm. So norm is always positive. So I have a negative sign. And then this term, by picking alpha sufficiently small, I can make this arbitrarily small. So I have a negative number and I have a small potentially positive number. So it could be positive, it could be negative, but it's a very small number. By picking alpha sufficiently small, I can make this small. So I have a negative number plus maybe a small positive number. So that will make sure that this particular side is negative and I get something which is strictly less than zero. I can do something more. I can do more complicated stuff. Can someone come up with a non-trivial D? I mean, this is a trivial D. This is definitely one D that makes sense. What else can we pick? How can you come up with a variation of this, which gives you a lot more freedom to pick D? Exponential? No, I don't think. You're not scaling this, right? You're just making sure that the inner product with gradient of fx must be negative. Yes? 
a uh, constant is already here. So every constant will get absorbed in alpha. OK, how about this? So D is a positive definite matrix. I multiply, pre-multiply the gradient with a positive definite matrix. So what do I have here? Negative of gradient transpose a positive definite matrix multiplied by gradient. What do we know about What is this quantity? It's strictly positive. As long as gradient of fx is not equal to 0, this quantity is strictly positive. Okay, So if gradient of fx is not equal to 0, remember if gradient of fx is equal to 0, we are done. We are already at a point that satisfies the first order necessary condition for optimality. So throughout this discussion, I'm assuming that the gradient of fx is not equal to zero, okay? Only then all of the stuff that we are talking about makes sense. In other words, if I replace this D here with this quantity, what I get is And this is known as a gradient descent algorithm. Alpha k. It's not a local minima, yeah. Because if it is a local minima, then gradient automatically vanishes. So. Any other question? Yeah, I think I missed how you got to that point. This point? Yeah. So I'm replacing D here, okay. this D here, with this expression. Okay, so I start with X naught, I compute this side, so I have to pick a alpha K which is sufficiently small and DK which is a positive definite matrix, and then I get X1, and then I do, do this whole operation all over again. What is the value of dk? Oh, I mean, advantage of adding dk here. Uh, we'll get to know in a bit, but basically by appropriately scaling dk in certain directions, you can make sure that this quantity is as high as uh, you want. Let's hold on to that question for a moment, okay? We just want to massage this particular value in a way that it's as high as we can make it to be, and that will help us to get to the solution much faster, okay? So, al so now the problem is, how do I pick alpha k and how do I pick dk, okay? That's my question. How do I pick alpha k, how do I pick alpha naught, alpha one, alpha two, and so on? How can I pick d1, d0, d1, d2, d3, and so on? Now, of course, uh, one easy option is you pick D to be identity matrix. It's a positive definite matrix. It's identity matrix. So that makes my life easy. And that's known as steepest descent. And then there are other ways of picking DK, uh, which we are going to talk about over the next five or six lectures. There are different, different DKs that you can pick. And you get a completely new algorithm for solving this problem. So that's the famous gradient descent algorithm. Any questions so far? Before I start erasing everything? No?
Okay. So let's uh, let's study different different algorithms. So I'm going to pick different DKs and I'm going to give it a different name. We are not going to talk about alpha k for now. We'll talk about it in 20 minutes. But let's spend the first 20 minutes, the next 20 minutes, talking about various values of DK. So steepest descent dk is equal to identity matrix newton's method So Newton's method is second derivative of the function f evaluated at xk inverse. Diagonally scaled steepest descent DK is a diagonal matrix. With you can pick whatever diagonal elements you want, and uh, and you just arrange it in a diagonal fashion, and that's your diagonally scaled steepest descent. As you can see, these are all positive definite matrices that we are picking. Modified <coughs> Newton's method. I'm so sorry, uh, second derivative. But it's still the initial point. Yeah, it's still the initial point, that's right. Discretized Newton's method. X0 is the initial condition, the first point that I picked in the gradient descent algorithm. So you pick the first point arbitrarily, like just pick origin or just pick 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, whatever you want to pick, okay? How is the um, discretized different than the... This is an approximation, that's an exact. So here is an approximation. So discretize Newton's method, like dif depending on what approximation you make for the second derivative, you get different types of discretized Newton's method. And again, we'll talk about a lot of these methods in the subsequent classes. Okay. So these are the five, there are more, and we'll talk about some of these other variations of uh, gradient descent algorithms in the subsequent classes. 
But I think the important thing to note here is as follows. Uh, first of all, you want the second derivative of the function to be positive definite, so that the inverse is also positive definite. If you have uh, points, let's say you are standing at xk and the sum of the eigenvalues of the second derivative of the function f is, uh, is negative, then you have, you have some problem and therefore in those cases you tend to add some more, uh, some more terms there in order to make sure that this is positive definite. So we'll again, uh, some of those variations we'll talk about it later on. So what happens in the corner cases is something we'll study in subsequent classes. So right now, let's just assume that all of these functions, all of these uh, matrices are positive definite, okay? So we'll not uh, look into, we'll look into it in maybe two or three classes later, what happens when these are not positive definite. Okay, uh, in diagonally scaled steepest descent, typically these values, so how many derivatives do you need to compute here? How many? How many entries do you need to compute here for this particular matrix? N squared. Um, not quite n square, so you have to look at all the lower triangular thing, right? So, yeah. Uh, the upper triangular will be the same as the lower triangular, so. N times n minus one by two. Correct, correct. So roughly uh, n square over two is uh, the number of elements, number of derivatives you need to compute. Uh, so that's very computationally intensive. So not just you have to compute those derivatives, but then you have to invert the matrix, okay? And matrix inversion is also a complex process, which takes quite a bit of effort. So if you don't want to go through all that hassle, all you can do is just compute the diagonal elements and then invert it, which is much easier to do, right? So you can, you can compute the end second derivatives, take the inverse, maybe add, subtract a few variables um, so that this becomes positive definite, then you get a diagonally scaled steepest descent, okay? Modified Newton's method says, look, I can't even compute this. So this is complicated, so I can compute this, but even this is complicated because I need to compute the second derivative at every iteration. So I'm, I'm lazy. I'm going to use this. I'll compute it once. I'll invert the matrix once at the beginning of time. And then I'm just going to use that forever. Okay, and hopefully the second derivative doesn't change much over the course of the iterations. So then modified Newton's is a good method. So if you are lazy, you use modified Newton. Uh, no, actually if you're very lazy, you use steepest descent. You don't even have to compute anything. If you're slightly less lazy, then you can use modified Newtons because you just have to compute it once, invert the matrix once, and then you are done. In discretized Newton's method, uh, we'll study a few of these uh, Newton's method, but uh, the idea is that instead of trying to compute the exact second derivative, let's just compute some approximation based on the knowledge that we have received so far, and then invert that matrix and get the value of dk, okay? So this is an approximation. Typically this approximation would be much simpler uh, to compute and potentially much easier to invert so that we can compute DK in a reasonable amount of time. When you're training neural networks or when you're training large language models and so on, the dimension of X could be of the order of billions could be of the order of multiple billions, hundreds of billions, perhaps a trillion. There is no hope of being able to compute these matrices, okay? So in those cases, we just go with steepest descent. That's it. We don't do any fancy stuff. When you have a small two variable, three variable, five variable optimization problem, you can infer, in fact invert this matrix in a microcontroller and you can implement the algorithm. And then there is everything in between, okay? So you can have 20 variable optimization problem and you can't really run it on a microcontroller but you have to do it in a vehicle. Then you come up with a more complicated microcontroller, you might come up with a more complicated processor to be able to invert some of these matrices and implement the algorithm. So depending on the hardware constraint, depending on the runtime constraint, so how much time do you have to compute the optimal solution? Uh, depending on the memory constraint, 
you will pick an appropriate choice of dk and you will implement the algorithm okay any question which one works the best uh, theoretically theoretically newton's method is the best and we'll talk about it right now why it is the best yes or any of these methods um, basically just changing the direction of the the descent based on the, the curvature that's right that's exactly what newton's method is trying to do theoretically the best on the board or theoretically the best the best on the board uh, but there is nothing much beyond this, and I'll tell you why. Uh, you can't go beyond Newton's method. It's kind of very difficult to go beyond Newton's method. Okay. So there's another way by, by which you can think about some of these methods. So in steepest descent, remember uh, f of x, plus alpha d is f of x plus gradient of f x transpose d alpha right so this is the taylor series expansion of the function one way to think about all of these descent algorithms is in the steepest descent, I am trying to minimize over all d. Well, I don't want to say Rn, but whatever. We need, we need to have some d which is finite. Uh, the first order Taylor expansion. So in steepest descent, what I do is I'm standing at xk. I look at the first order Taylor expansion of the function f of x plus alpha d. And I need to pick the d, which minimizes the first order Taylor expansion. Of course, the, the optimal d is going to be negative infinity times gradient of fx transpose. But I want to avoid that infinity term. So just assume that this d is supposed to be in some bounded ball, in which case you get, a, you get something which is scaled as negative of gradient of fxk. And then, of course, you multiply it by the scaling factor alpha to make sure that you are taking a small step. But anyway, this is one way to think about how steepest descent work. On the other hand, in Newton's method, you pick dk to be argmin over d of f of x k you take the second order term and then you minimize uh, this particular expression and you get exactly the Newton's method. You get this method. So how can you go faster than Newton's method? More terms. More terms, right? You take the third order term here. The problem is we don't quite know how to minimize. When you have a tensor here and you have a D transpose tensor D multiplied by another d, right? So it's like trying to solve a third degree polynomial in d. And that's a difficult problem. So I think all of you know how to solve a second degree polynomial if you want to minimize 
a two degree polynomial, you take the first derivative, set it equal to zero, you get the optimal solution. Same thing happens in matrices as well. But if you have a third degree polynomial and I want you to optimize it, it's very difficult to optimize it. And then if you take a fourth degree polynomial and I ask you to optimize it, again, it becomes harder and harder as you have higher and higher order terms in the expression. So kind of sort of Newton's method is where we are stuck. We would like to go higher, but it's order of magnitude more difficult to just come up with the D. So we want D to be easily computable because eventually I want to compute X star. I don't want to compute D star, right? So you kind of stop at Newton's method and hope that this matrix inverse is not too difficult for you to be able to compute the solution. Okay, so that's how you figure out what the descent direction dk is supposed to be. And of course, uh, between the simple one and the most difficult one, you have a bunch of other methods that you can apply and hopefully uh, it'll give you a reasonable solution in reasonable amount of time. I think one thing that you should always remember when you're doing optimization, time is an important factor. Memory is also an important factor depending on what's the environment in which you are solving this optimization. So if I wanted to optimize the temperature of this room, and I'm sure there is a thermostat somewhere in the back of the room. Oh, there are actually two thermostats here. Uh, so, uh, so I need to solve this problem in that thermostat itself, right? And that's a difficult, because in thermostat you don't really have complex processor. At the very, the most you can do is apply steepest descent because you might be able to do it in a small microcontroller or a microprocessor. Uh, but if you had more option, let's say you have this entire building and you want to optimize the entire building's temperature in every 15 minutes interval, then I think you can just put a big CPU, I don't know, put a GPU, <laughs> and then you can compute all the inverse you want in the world to be able to solve the problem in 15 minutes and figure out what the optimal temperature for the next 15 minutes is going to be. Okay, so just imagine, um, once upon a time, long, long time ago, like six years ago, uh, we were working on a vehicle and we wanted to optimize the velocity of the vehicle. Uh, this was a research project at Center for Automotive Research. And we had to do some dynamic optimization. So dynamic optimization, not something we are studying right now, but we'll be studying it two months later. So we were doing a dynamic optimization and we were able to solve the optimization in 200 milliseconds on the hardware that was available on the vehicle. And 200 millisecond was not good enough. We needed to compute it in under 50 milliseconds. So we had to do a lot of algorithm design in order to be able to solve it under 50 milliseconds. So again, you know, time is important depending on the situation, depending on the constraint, depending on the hardware, depending on the memory on the hardware, you may or may not be able to solve the problem based on whatever is the best algorithm you know of. Okay, so neural network, this is just not possible. This is very much possible. In fact, this is what we all use. If you're doing biomedical engineering or signal processing for, I don't know, the cancer hospital, sometimes you have, sometimes you use this discretized Newton's method or diagonally scale steepest descent to be able to solve those optimization problems. So it's all, all over the place, okay? One size fits all doesn't work in optimization. All right. So we have talked about how to pick the direction DK, uh, or rather the positive definite matrix capital DK. Now we need to talk about how to pick alpha K. So let's look at how alpha K are picked.
So we pick the minimization rule. So alpha k equals to argmin over alpha greater than zero. f of xk plus alpha dk. Sorry? Argmin of alpha greater than zero. Same thing here, argmin of alpha between in the set zero to S. No, here we are talking about optimizing D. Yeah. Uh, but now I've already picked a specific DK, let's say Newton's method. Okay, so you picked some gradient inverse. And then you have picked the gradient, so that's my dk. This is my dk. Okay, you have already picked. I've picked, let's say I'm doing Newton's method, right? So I have picked my capital dk and I know what the gradient is, I've computed that. So that gave me my dk, and now I need to figure out what my alpha k is. Okay, so depending on if you're using steepest descent or if you're using Newton's method or modified Newton, this dk is gonna be different. So that's why I'm using DK here and not the capital DK. Okay, so in minimization rule, you pick any alpha greater than zero that minimizes this function. Hopefully computing this argmin is easier. If it is not easy, then you use bisection method or some other method to find this argmin. Uh, if you cannot do this for all alpha greater than zero, you do it for a set of alpha between zero to S. That's called a limited minimization rule. Then we have Armijo's rule. So Armijo's rule is a bit complicated. Alpha P equals to alpha p, which is greater than equals to minus sigma. Okay, so I'll let you guys write it and then we'll discuss what this is trying to do. So alpha p is computed in this fashion, so I'll talk about it. So first you pick p equals to zero, see if this condition is satisfied or not. If it is not satisfied, then you pick p equals to one, then see if this condition is satisfied or not. So if let's say for p equals to five, this condition is satisfied, then alpha k becomes equal to alpha five. Maybe it's not a good idea to write it as a subscript. Let me write it as a, no. Even superscript is not a good idea. Let me write it in this way.
Yeah, so that way you don't confuse between subscript and function of p. How do you use beta? Uh, we'll talk about it in a bit. Okay, I'll just write down all the five methods. Okay, yeah. Uh, so this, uh, this series should sum to infinity, which means it should be very large. Not very large, it should actually be infinity. So remember we had this one question on the quiz, what is summation of one over k? And what you had shown was summation of one over k, it grows as log of k. So as you take k going to infinity, log of k also goes to infinity. Right, so summation of one over k is infinity, but summation of one over k square is actually finite. Okay. So this means that you have diminishing step size, which means that alpha k goes to zero, but summation of alpha k still goes to infinity. So it doesn't go to zero fast enough. It goes to zero very slowly. So one over k is one such way of picking alpha k, which doesn't go to infinity, which, which uh, doesn't go to zero fast enough. It goes very slowly to zero. So that's a diminishing step size. Constant step size is, of course, constant. These two are sort of easy to understand. So let's talk about Armijo's rule. So Armijo's rule is a way to successively pick the step size, which meets this particular requirement. So f of xk is the current value. This is the future value that I want to get. And I want the difference between the current value and the future value to be sufficiently large. So this sigma is strictly positive. Beta is between 0 and 1. S is a constant. So S greater than 0, sigma greater than 0. And beta is between 0 and 1. Uh, so the idea is that uh, sigma could be like somewhere between 0 0.1 or something along those lines. So you can pick sigma to be a small number greater than 0. S could be any number, 5, 1, 4, whatever you want. <clears throat> the idea here is that you want to make sure that this descent is going to be sufficiently large for us to pick that as the step size. So how does this work? So we pick p equals to 1. So p equals to 0, so I only have s, and I compute this uh, difference. If it is greater than this value, then it's great. If it is not greater than this value, then you pick p equals to 1. So you get s beta, then you apply s beta here, you apply s beta here, and then you see if this statement is valid, if this inequality is valid. If this inequality is valid, then your alpha k is equal to 
S times beta, because for P equals to one, that particular condition was satisfied. So you pick P here as the minimum, minimum value uh, so that this particular inequality is satisfied. That gives you alpha k. And what it's basically doing is this is my xk. So this is my xk plus s dk. This is my xk plus s beta dk. This is my xk plus s beta square dk. Okay, so I first look at, remember the difference is, the difference is uh, this much. This is the difference when p equals to zero, right? So this is my f of xk and this is my f of xk plus s dk. And you see the difference is small, so it's not worth it to take that step. So I'm going to reduce the step size. I'm going to make the step size s beta dk. And this, that gets me to this point. And now you see the difference is quite high. And if it, is, if it meets this threshold requirement, then you are in game, you can pick alpha k to be equals to s beta. If not, then you look at the next one, xk plus s beta square dk. You look at the difference, this difference is quite high. If it meets the threshold requirement, you pick that particular value as alpha k, yeah. This term is negative. Remember, dk is minus, minus capital DK F gradient of FXK. So this is negative, and with this negative, it becomes a positive number. This is positive, this is positive. What's the problem with Armijo's rule? Okay, so let's look at the problems with picking alpha K. What is the complexity of minimizing a function with respect to alpha? Reasonably complex. Unless the function is very well behaved, this would be a very complex uh, computation. But we'll see when this computation is easy to do. We'll look at an example later on. But this is a, a complex computation in general. Sometimes it could be easier. This is also a complex computation. Typically using bisection method, you can solve this particular problem. But it still takes quite a bit of effort to implement limited minimization. Constant step size is kind of brainless. You don't have to apply any brain. Here is my alpha, I'm going to use this alpha forever. And diminishing step size is also kind of brainless. Yes, you have to compute one over k, but you know it's not that difficult to compute one over k. So in some sense, so in, in again in LLM and in neural network training and so on, they use a combination of these two step sizes. So they'll keep a constant step size for 10 iterations, then they'll reduce the step size, then they'll keep it constant for 10 iterations, then they'll reduce the step size, then they'll keep it constant for 10 iterations. So that's how they get the diminishing step size part. But it is constant for a certain period, maybe 10 iterations, 15 iterations, and so on. Sometimes you change the step size in every iteration. That's completely up to you. Let's talk about Armijo's rule. What is the complexity of Armijo's rule? Where does the complexity of Armijo's rule come from? What would be the most complex operation in that expression? So if I have to compute this, what is a complex operation in order to compute this? So gradient is something that I have to compute. DK is something I have to compute. Is inner product difficult? Not quite, okay? So I think for maybe 100, 200 dimensions, you can still do inner product, not a big problem. Computing alpha p is not difficult. Multiplying all these variables is not difficult. What about this side? 
So you have to do multiple function evaluations here. Okay, at every iteration you might have to do two, three, five, ten function evaluations. And typically when you are in a complex function domain, like if you're solving a, if you're trying to minimize a complex function, function evaluation actually takes a lot more time. Okay? So you don't want to use Armijo's rule when you have to do a lot of function evaluation. So I'll give you an example. Uh, if you're using machine learning algorithms, your data set is half of it is in Bay Area, half of it is in Texas, half of it is in Ohio data centers. And you need to do this function evaluation, you really cannot do it because you have to collect all the data in one server, you'll have to compute what the function looks like. And then you will have to figure out whether that particular, uh, that particular alpha k works out for you or not. So, so that's why Armijo's rule cannot be used. If your function is simple to compute, function evaluation doesn't take too much effort. Armijo's rule is a very good choice for picking alpha k. Uh, but if your function evaluation is difficult, don't use Armijo's rule. Okay? So in, in difficult functions, you only use constant step size or diminishing step size. Now you can play around with 1 over k. You can make it alpha k equals to c1 over c2 plus k. Okay, you can pick a small c2, you can pick a large c1. So you can play around with alpha k here. You can pick up, pick different types of diminishing step sizes in order to solve this problem. Uh, I mean, in order to pick alpha k, uh, but, uh, but predominantly you will be using, so if you are working in a complicated business, these are the two step sizes you will use. Uh, but if your problem has some special structure, you can use this. And if your function evaluation is easy, then you can use Armijo's rule. So that's all I have for today. Uh, we still have like two, three minutes. If anybody has questions, I'll answer them. Otherwise, we can adjourn for today. Any questions? Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Uh, we'll see you on Monday. Yeah. So, uh, assuming the function is easily computable, so in that case, um,